Yes, I'm doing good. I'm sorry. Okay, I'll tell you what, Jamie. Thank you. 
Which is a little bit easier to get to, I think. Yeah, or, you know, I think it's. Thanks for having me. Nice to be here. Keep Andrew. I just don't want to be in DC. What's that? You're based in DC. I am. Yeah. We're in the Ronald Reagan building here. Okay. We trade office in there. Okay. Just do some more work. She's going to get us going to start in the local part. Yeah, I hope so. We're always looking for moderators. We do 225 public trade events a year. So we do give her one of you. So do you remember what we did? I do. Two years ago, yeah. Rock House, we yeah. had the XMI. I think my colleague Kosai was involved in that one. Okay. Lady with the bag, yeah. yeah. I think I was at that. 
I try to yeah, go to the international. It was really exciting. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was great. And they were making news with the IMF and the bank and stuff like that. So yeah. there were cameras actually in there when you walked in. And <laughs> that's always made fun. It's such a big place, but it's really a big place. Yeah. So, well, if you ever, and if you ever see anything that you want to come to as my guest, let me know. Okay. Because we, we, uh, we do sponsor a lot of the stuff that goes on. So we have tickets. Great. Especially yeah. trade policy. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Morale. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Check my crotch is open, so we're good. <laughs> I caught it in the hallway on the way here. <laughs> uh, oh, good oh, oops, sorry. Shall I start? You okay? Yeah, yeah. please. Hi. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for coming. I'm Jonathan Tepperman, Editor-in-Chief of Foreign Policy. We're thrilled to have you all here this morning for the launch of the new World Trade Center 
uh, Association Trade and Investment Report, Global Connections and Local Growth. And yes, despite um, the events in Canada this weekend, there still is global trade. Um, and uh, uh, things like the World Trade Center Association are making sure that that continues. Um, the, uh, the report was produced by FP Analytics, which is led by um, the world famous Claire Casey to my far left, um, and in partnership with the World Trade Center Association. Um, this event is being webcast uh, with a live feed on YouTube, so we encourage you all to send in your comments and questions uh, to tweet and retweet um, throughout. Uh, and we expect this to be a very lively and informative um, conversation. And I'm going to be relying on all of you as well as all of you to make sure that that happens. Let me give you a, a brief overview of how things are going to work. Uh, in a moment, Claire, who is the managing director of FP Analytics will lead, and who led the research and production of the report, I should say, um, will provide a brief overview of the study um, and highlight the key findings so that can serve as the um, the background for what, what we proceed to uh, discuss. But before handing it over to Claire, let me introduce the rest of the people sitting up here with me. Um, to my immediate left, I'm in, delighted to introduce a uh, fellow Canadian and the CEO of the WTCA, Scott Ferguson. Um, Scott has over 30 years experience working in international business and has received recognition in Canada and internationally for his uh, work uh, uh, in innovation and um, developing organizations. Um, let me turn the page so I make sure I don't get this wrong. Um, and uh, his position at the top of the WTCA gives him a panoramic view of exactly what the organization is doing all around the world. Um, next, we have Blair Rubel, who's a distinguished fellow at the Wilson Center. Blair has perhaps the most um, idiosyncratic background of any of us up here. Um, he started working in uh, Soviet um, studies out of grad school um, and then uh, has migrated to um, focusing on cities. Um, and uh, the arts as well, working on migration, innovation, um, culture, um, and um, many more topics ex as well. Finally, um, on, on Blair's left is Linda Conlin. Um, even though she just told me how to pronounce her, um, her maiden name in the middle, I'm not even going to try. Um, she's the president of the WTC of Greater Philadelphia where she and her team provide a portfolio of international trade services and global connections to help the region's companies succeed in global markets and expand the economy. Linda um, also has a very rich and diverse background, um, most of it focused on international trade and finance and public policy, but in different areas and for different agencies. She was on the board of directors uh, of the US Export-Import Bank. Um, before that, she was an assistant secretary of commerce working on trade development. She's also worked at the State Department and at other very interesting places. So that's who we have lined up for you. Um, but before they start talking, Claire, why don't you give us an overview? So thanks, Jonathan, and thanks everyone for coming and everyone who's tuning into the webcast. Um, I thought I would start by just giving a little bit of background on why we at FP were excited to do this report with the World Trade Center Association. Can we do the first slide? Um, when we were looking at what is already a pretty active discourse around how cities can lead, we were thinking about where we could add some real value. And the resource that we saw was this really unique global network of local businesses. So the World Trade Center Association has 315 cities represented by its organ member organizations in 86 countries. They represent a billion people in total and 35% of global GDP. So it really is this massive organization. The cities are small and large. They're in industrialized countries and developing countries. What they have in common is that all of the members are actively thinking about how to connect their local business community and local economy into the global economy more effectively. So we thought that was a tremendous resource to be able to tap. So what we've done for this report is combine in-depth interviews with more than 30 members from around the world with polling of members and then some original data analysis looking at the factors that are associated with competitiveness and improved economic outcomes at the local level by connecting into the global economy. So um, if we can go to the next slide. About two to three months ago we did most of the interviews and the polling and what was consistent throughout was that members saw the fundamentals of the global economy as being really strong, really positive. But 
there was tremendous potential for what I would describe as unforced errors on the policy side. Um, and this was just a polling result from, um, from the membership. 71%, this was about two months ago, saw a major disruption in trade investment this year as likely or highly likely. Um, and I think that events of the last few days have, have shown that that is, that is probably correct. Um, going forward, we still have to think about, even within a difficult, a difficult macro picture, how can cities compete? How can they position themselves to, to, to generate um, growth and, and prosperity for their citizens? Um, and what we found was human capital is paramount. I have a quote there from the World Trade Center San Diego talking about how it used to be all about cost and now it's about talent. And that was reiterated in almost all of our interviews. And the data proved that out as well. So when we looked at the factors that were associated with growth or generation of FDI or trade, exports, we found that a thousand additional people in a city with tertiary ed education is associated with, and I thought I was going to be able to see that screen, uh, <laughs> but I think it's almost $400,000 um, a year in FDI inflows. Um, and then it's not just about that human capital and, and the university system and what you're developing locally, even though that's so important. It's also about being open to immigration and being having the best talent coming to you. Um, we looked at foreign-born residents as a share of the total population. Um, and we found that that was closely correlated with positive economic outcomes. The one I have here, although there are several in the report, I'm um, talking about the share of the population, but here we have a thousand additional foreign-born residents in your city is associated with more than a million in annual FDI inflows additional and um, 30 million in additional exports. So the cities that have diverse populations um, are, are more connected to the global economy and generating better outcomes. To me, that was really an important finding because it speaks to the larger focus of this report, which is on cities. When we talk about immigration, we often talk about the individual and the net cost of a, and, or benefit to our economy of one person crossing a border. Um, so do they pay in taxes? What services do they take away from us? Um, but that's not how we function as economies or societies. Um, and it's part of an ecosystem. And so this, this finding that, that welcoming workers into our cities has a, has a positive economic impact was very, very interesting to me in terms of contributing to that debate. Can we move forward? Uh, we also found that connective infrastructure was extremely important. Um, if you look at cities with below average internet penetration, which is about the data folks can correct me. I think it's about 53% of connected households. Um, if you're below that, um, a 10 percentage point increase is associated in a boost in GDP per capita growth of half a percentage point, which is actually fairly significant when you think about what we're growing at in most of our economies today. Um, for every 10 percentage point increase in household mobile phone penetration, you see a boost in GDP growth by 0.2 percentage points. And an additional 1 million public transport passengers is associated with additional half a million in FDI inflows. So these are, we're not, we're not suggesting causality here, but the cities that have these stronger um, infrastructure uh, ties are able to, to see better ec economic outcomes. Um, can we go forward? This was particularly interesting to me looking at airports. When we spoke, this data result came out, came out after we'd done a lot of our interviews. And when I was speaking to World Trade Centers, particularly in landlocked cities, they were constantly describing their airports as their ports. And that was how they were connecting into the world. And issues of had been having direct flights internationally was a major factor in whether or not a company would want to do their US or, or Chile or, or, or France headquarters in that, in that city. Um, we found that for every 1,000 people transiting through an airport, you see a $30,000 increase in FDI inflows, a million almost in exports, and 7.3 million in GDP. Um, so can we go forward? That brings me to um, what we've been calling the network effect, which is what, what brings all of this together, which is how do you create both the global network, which WTCA represents, where you're connecting cities all around the world and business people all around the world together, with a really robust local network that builds an ecosystem that makes a city competitive and attractive. Um, when, we, when we polled the members, they, by a long shot, shows a collaborative network of local stakeholders as the most significant driver in um, local growth and development. 
a head of connectivity or infrastructure or capital um, or even local government support. So what does that look like? Um, and here we have less data and more anecdote, but I think it's anecdote from the folks around the world who are actively thinking about um, and working on these issues. So that network where across countries was made up of academic institutions, not just in terms of building the right human capital pipeline, but also partnering with business on innovation, working directly with institutions like World Trade Centers on trade education programs. So really, and also inviting students from around the world into that community, and then they can go home and, and be ambassadors for it. Um, Civil society organizations like local chambers of commerce that are advocating for the business community, but also independent civil society organizations that help create a stable policy environments for, for business and help facilitate um, development projects and, and building community support. Uh, local government um, and regional government, and while I will say that the primary message I heard from members was first do no harm, um, they also have a vital role in supporting infrastructure, academic institutions, and having supportive and um, appropriate policy frameworks. Um, and most important, I think, across the board was the business network. And that's where the World Trade Center Association members are often sort of sitting in the middle and facilitating these relationships. Um, when we spoke to people, they talked a lot about what they do in terms of engaging with the global network, whether it's trade missions or global MOUs, which I think we're going to hear more about um, later this morning, finding issues of shared interest around the world where you can connect businesses together and develop potential deals, um, but also creating that network locally where you can tap in to to the various players that are necessary to facilitate inward investment and also facilitating um, exports. Um, and I think that there are some really interesting stories around both of those. Um, one story that I found most compelling as we're thinking about trade issues, and Brexit is certainly front of mind for, for all the countries in the EU and the UK, um, I sat down with the head of the World Trade Center in Lille in northwest France. And she has established a business lounge for English business people to come over and consider Lille as their headquarters in Europe. Um, based on their access to Paris, Brussels, Amsterdam, um, and just having that physical space to be able to work, rest, um, and have a home base while you're considering that transition struck me as one of the innovative ways that, that these organizations can actually facilitate human-to-human -human connection, which is still the basis of business, um, even in this digital, this digital age. So I'm not going to continue. I'm going to turn it over to, to a broader discussion, because we have the experts here who, who really know about how to do this right. But there are fabulous stories about businesses supporting businesses, learning circles, where folks who are experienced in international trade can sort of mentor SMEs that don't have any experience. And that is our final slide, which is we noted that SMEs are really the driver of, of GDP growth and employment across, uh, we, this, these are OECD economies, but it's true around the world. Um, 50 to 60 percent of value add comes from F SMEs, 70 percent of jobs, but they are the least engaged in the global economy. And so helping those organizations, whether it's mentorship, or trade education, partner identification, market assessment, helping them take that next step into the global economy is one of the most important um, roles of organizations like this and where there's the greatest potential um, going forward, even in difficult economic climates. So. Thanks so much, Claire. So um, what I propose to do is, is spend about 30 minutes asking our panelists questions and then open things up to the floor um, so you all can weigh in and ask your questions as well. Um, uh, Scott, I want to start with you. Um, one of the, the headlines that Claire just highlighted was um, these very understandable concerns about trade disruption and um, political risk. Um, is that something that you're hearing um, from, you know, in your perch as CEO from members around the world? Um, and how are people, um, uh, WTCA's individual chapters, um, uh, trying to manage and, and mitigate that risk? So, thank you. So, as, as Clara said, you know, we, we researched through our members, and you know, 71 percent of our members have indicated that they are are not happy and are with the current uh, state of uh, disruption and expect some kind of disruption over the next year. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that they they stop doing business. The beauty of our association, quite frankly, is that 
We've got 300 members who in turn have members around the world in over 80 cities, and they're engaged in business on a, on a daily basis. So what they try to do is understand what's happening. Um, we did some uh, conference calls, some very quick calls with our members to understand even the discussion on steel and aluminum tariffs and how that might affect uh, their businesses. And within days, we had opinion from them, such as the Midwest, the U.S., which is a hotbed for craft brewing, and the fact that you know those craft brewers had, had recently transitioned to aluminum cans, and now all of a sudden this was going to have a significant disruption impact for them. Now, that was something that we got within days of having that discussion. Uh, same thing with uh, some of our European members on automobile. Uh, automobile import exporting and with our Canadian members where the supply chain is so integrated across the border it's a great deal of confusion over how that you know how that can affect their business and what could they do or not do to avoid any further disruption so the thing from my end is that you know we, we explored that very quickly with our members and got an immediate response back and uh, then that enables us to start voicing that opinion quite frankly but they are as, as all business people do uh, read and react and uh, they look to our network I think to find uh, new innovative ways to attack any of these challenges that uh, they face Linda, um, you were at the federal government uh, or the federal level for a long time, and now you're working at the municipal level. Um, talk about the kinds of um, challenges um, that you're facing in Philadelphia due to international trade policy set at the national level due to geopolitics dictated by national lear uh, leaders. Um, how is it actually affecting things on the ground in Philadelphia? We keep uh, in close contact with our, our member companies. We're a, a small nonprofit as a World Trade Center, and, and we uh, really uh, uh, value very much the relationship that we have with our uh, member companies. Uh, each year we work maybe with about four to five hundred individual companies and these companies are advising us, are sharing with us the the concerns that they have over uh, the the international rules of of trade being being changed and uh, specifically with the uh, recent uh, tariffs um, one example is one of our companies has had some materials held up in in port uh, he's had to renegotiate uh, contracts with with his suppliers he's had to raise costs so they're uh, they're dealing with these uh, these issues and having to make adjustments uh, within their pricing uh, models as an example but we feel as a world trade center that we can act as a conduit of this information to our national um, our international association and also as a conduit of information to uh, leaders in 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 Washington uh, as well what kind of response do you get when you go to Washington well, it's it's as you know, it's kind of my second my second home, having uh, served here uh, uh, for many many years, uh, and I think that that uh, certainly Washington is open to hearing from uh, businesses, and certainly for the from the small and medium sized businesses that uh, really represent the majority of our of our clients, and it's important to keep those lines of, of communication uh, open. At the end of the day, uh, what we stand for are free and fair and open markets and the best kind of uh, business environment for our companies to expand business and, and succeed. Blair, another one of the headline uh, findings has to do with the incredibly um, important role that immigration plays um, in um, helping cities uh, build and maintain skilled labor forces, but way beyond that as well. Talk about some of the, um, the obvious and less obvious ways in which immigration helps cities. Because you know it, it, it's predictable that, for example, if you have a skills gap in one area and you bring in expert, uh, immigrants who, are, who, who have those skills, that, that's a way to do it. But it, it's, what's interesting is Claire, um, Claire's research and, and, and lots of other research suggests that there are all of these uh, much less predictable and perhaps less direct knock-on effects that immigration and immigrants yeah. contribute. No, I think immigration is, is clear before I, I come on in that I just want to congratulate Claire on a, a wonderful report I hope you'll spend some time with it, it here, here. it's a path-breaking report because it does a couple of, of things and one is the title global connections but it also puts World Trade Centers at the center of those connections and I, I think World Trade Centers haven't always been thought of in that context so I, I just before I, I turn to the immigration issue 
want to um, comment on that. You know, I think um, obviously this is a political moment, not just in this country, but in many parts of the world where uh, immigration is a hot button topic. And as emotions have kicked in, we've tended to move past some of the actual data that demonstrates the very positive impacts of immigration. Uh, it's tied to the importance of human capital in general. Um, and I, I think that there are examples uh, where we can see uh, the presence of immigrants and their integration through the cooperation, not just of the government, but of the private sector, uh, um, adding new important vitality. And perhaps the, the best example of this is we think of Toronto as the, you know, the ultimate immigrant city, and yet 50 years ago, Toronto's nickname was the American Belfast. And it was a terribly divided city, mm. and, but there was a political consensus that came together that involved the business community. There was a need for labor, but it wasn't just getting labor there. It was empowering the labor to build, to build their lives. Mm -hmm. Investment in education. And I think uh, the, the, the enormous investment that a number of, of Ontario governments put in education in the 50s and 60s gave pathways into a, a, a more exciting future for the, uh, the second generation immigrants. I think that's how we need to think about immigration. It's not just that, oh, there are people walking around who don't speak my language and don't look like me. What are they doing here? It's what are the benefits that come from having immigrants here? And the Toronto case is a very good example of over a long period of time, um, a, um, a consensus, if you will, emerging among various political actors and the business community to be sure that the immigrants who were coming were integrated in, into Canadian right. society. And there are other examples too, a very surprising example I just mentioned, Yekaterinburg in Russia has had very severe um, uh, labor shortages. And for a variety of reasons, even today, they've been very welcoming of, of immigrants, primarily from Central Asia. And because they bring skills that are needed. Mm -hmm. It usually, this last point, it usually takes a certain kind of political leadership. There, at a critical moment, the local governor was an ethnic German who remembered being taunted as a kid after World War II, and he didn't want that to happen to anybody else. And he was very active in changing the climate. So leadership enters in here too. Yeah, I mean the interesting thing about the Canadian story which I've written about is that Canada didn't change um, in the mid-60s because it was particularly virtuous. Right. Um, it changed because it had to. And the reason that it had to is Canadian industry was booming, um, uh, uh, but Canada's preferred source for workers, which at the time were, uh, uh, was Europe. Um, because uh, up until the late 1950s, Canada had had an explicitly racist immigration right. policy. Um, w w Europe was no longer exporting workers because it was finally recovering from World War II. So Canada realized it had to um, uh, 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 open its doors more widely because it had, there was no other way to get the bodies that it needed to, mm -hmm. to staff its timber mills and um, its factories, et cetera. Um, but then what Canada did was create create a, uh, a, an extremely intelli intelligently designed new immigration system which emphasized imp economic impact right. um, and, and throughout national origin um, and also de-emphasized what is still the focus in the United States which is family reunification which is a, um, an appealing in some ways policy but it's also somewhat irrational because mm -hmm. it, it lets arbitrary factors like luck right. to shape your immigrant population. Um, Linda, um, uh, does Philadelphia face a, a, a big skills gap, um, and um, where, and, and what are you doing about it there? Actually, uh, Philadelphia, uh, for, for years, and this continues, uh, has been known uh, as a great uh, source of, of growth in its educational institutions and uh, in the life sciences sector. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are seeing a wonderful collaboration with our universities and our business communities. In fact, uh, if we look at the high-tech sector overall, uh, it's responsible for 25% of overall uh, job growth. 
So I think when we talk about the skills factor, uh, we uh, in Philadelphia have seen uh, growth in the number of technology companies, uh, growth in the number of startups, and a rich uh, collaboration, as I say, with universities and, and businesses um, to, to really uh, address and to really make sure that we're producing uh, graduates uh, who have the skills that are necessary uh, for these growth sectors. In fact, an interesting fact is that there are over 100, I think 104 to be exact, colleges and universities in the greater Philadelphia area that produce annually some 90,000 degrees. And I think the most interesting fact is that there is a 66% retention rate now think wow. of what that means for talent and retaining talent and growing talent. Uh, so I think on the skills side, I think uh, Philadelphia and Greater Philadelphia has a wonderful resource of, of talent into the future and to really uh, uh, serve uh, leading growth sectors, for example, in the life sciences, biopharma, uh, gene therapy is an example of uh, sectors. I want to ask a couple of questions about the relationship between federal and local government, um, uh, specifically about what happens when the federal government doesn't act, how cities can do things on their own. So since we were talking about immigration and skills. Let's stick with that for a second. Um, immigration policy is set at the federal level, of course. So um, what can cities do um, in the absence of immigration reform to help, uh, at the very least, attract more of the immigrants that are, are still coming into the country? And whichever of you wants to take that, Kim. Well, I, I think this leads to one of the challenges that underlies the report. Um, you can't run up a down escalator forever. And um, since we're, we, we've already put Toronto on the, on the table, the federal policy set the conditions within which Ontario and Toronto officials could act. I, I think. Um, Part of what cities can obviously try to engage communities. Uh, we see this happening uh, in, in this country in a number of jurisdictions. Uh, it can promote business opportunities. It can try as much as possible to make sure that re its residents feel safe and connected. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, on a policy like immigration, uh, federal policy matters a lot. Mm -hmm. If I might interject there, because one of, I will actually harken back to my first interview of many on this project, which was with the World Trade Center in St. Louis. And what they recognized was that facilitating not just permanent immigration, but also the arrival of, of folks for a period of time. I started my career, whoop, I started my career in an Anglo-Dutch multinational where a significant portion of the, of the corporate staff were there from the UK or um, the Netherlands. And being being a destination which would be comfortable to set up um, and for your for your executives to bring their families and to be welcomed in your community is a huge part of, of this equation as well. And so St. Louis has a very organized, robust, cross-sectoral approach to this where they're actually facilitating the arrival and integration of, 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 of folks from overseas into, into the St. Louis community so they feel a part of that community. It's not just for business executives, but the business community there is, is deeply invested in it um, because they see that as a really important source of growth. They have some strategic sectors. I think Philadelphia is one of the cities that's been working with the Brookings Institution on their cities program. St. Louis is another one. Um, and recognizing that they have certain strategic industries that everyone in the world should want to be there. Mm -hmm. They should want to be in this hub of innovation. Um, but what are, how can you create the conditions that actually make that attractive for them? And it's less tax breaks, I think, and more what does this community look like? Is it a pleasant place to live? Is there public transport? Will I feel welcome? Um, and businesses engaging on the will I feel welcome part, I think it's a huge, huge part of it. And just to underscore something Clara said, and this goes back to the World Trade Centers. World Trade Centers aren't just looking outward, they're looking in their communities. And they are very well placed to bring together, the make the kinds of connections 
that uh, local connections as well as global connections that can lead to these kinds of policy. Yeah, Blair, if I could add to that, uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, we've got an incredibly diverse membership. So when you go from city to city, you'll see that uh, certain World Trade Centers concentrate on certain themes and certain sectors. Uh, but one common theme is collaboration. And, uh, you know, we have a number of conference uh, based uh, World Trade Centers where it's all about attracting International Congress activity and of course they work very very closely with universities uh, to attract those events and to promote those events and to attract talent worldwide. So even, even if you look at the meetings and conventions business around the world and uh, this, the country of Australia's example is known as one that uses the attraction of conferences uh, for talent retention and immigration because they want to bring in the folks that have the expertise to leverage the investment, the public investment they've already made. Same thing happens in a small city like Halifax that work closely with Dalhousie University. It's all about leveraging the public dollars and then trying to bring conferences in because that's the focus, which is a conference. Other World Trade Centers focus on some other aspect, but there is often collaboration uh, with those uh, municipal or uh, public players. And if I may add uh, and build upon uh, uh, Claire's uh, comment, in Philadelphia, there's been about a 16% increase in the number of, of immigrants coming into our community. And we have a rich uh, and vibrant immigrant community, entrepreneurial community within uh, Philadelphia. And because of that, we have an organization called the Welcoming Center for New Pennsylvanians in Philadelphia. And they are charged with exactly that, making our immigrant community feel welcome, integrating them into, into the, the community, into the, into the city. And just recently, uh, we uh, launched a partnership with the Welcoming uh, Center uh, of, uh, in, in Philadelphia, focused on tapping into the knowledge and the enthusiasm and expertise of our immigrant entrepreneurs and making that knowledge available to companies just beginning to export. So I think it's part of this whole uh, system and network and, and fabric of, of really uh, capitalizing on the knowledge and the experience that's available in our immigrant uh, communities. Just the other uh, week we had uh, two uh, young entrepreneurs come in with an app that focused on, on uh, public speaking. It's really very, very uh, innovative. And one young man was from, uh, from Pakistan, the other from, from India, recent graduates, engineers from Drexel University, now going and sponsored by the Close School of Entrepreneurship. But this is one small example of the young entrepreneurs that are coming uh, forward, and an example of how Philadelphia is, is uh, is really uh, supporting its its immigrant uh, entrepreneurs as well. Another traditional uh, role that the federal government plays is uh, funding and building infrastructure, and that's another thing that's not currently happening in this country, at least. Um, uh, and yet, infrastructure um, in 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 uh, in many varieties, um, but especially when it comes to transportation, of course, is critical for um, the economic success of cities. Um, I know that there are certain cities around the country and around the world who have found innovative ways to fund, um, to build and, and fund um, projects that the federal government once might have done. New York City under Bloomberg um, was one of them. Um, I'd love if one of you could talk about what those sort of new models look like and who's leading uh, the way. No, I'll make one comment about the city. I'm from Halifax uh, and we recently just completed a project which was a P3 partnership on building a new multi-use convention center and it was run by the World Trade Center organization um, and it was a half a million, um, it was a million square feet, half a billion dollars and the model that was chosen was that three levels of government were contributing uh, funds up front. The federal contribution of approximately 60 million dollars went into capital. The others uh, turned into lease payments over 35 year period. So really it provided the developer who then had to raise his own financing and funding and then live with any issues with respect to being over budget or not, which didn't get transferred back publicly if there was some issues, resulted in an incredible building that just opened and uh, the, the taxpayer uh, was in for a, sick, a certain amount of money up front. It didn't grow beyond that and it was a private sector taking the risk, frankly, and developing it. So it was a, a good example, I think, of a, a good solid uh, P3 partnership. You know, there's a negative side to this which I want to touch on because I think it will highlight the role of organizations like World Trade Centers working locally. Um, Public transportation systems are expensive, mm -hmm. so you need to get investment from multiple levels of government. And for that to happen, there needs to be a political consensus about what should happen to go forward. 
I was reading about the in, in a report. There's an example of uh, transportation innovation in Toronto, and I was thinking about. Uh, the subway map of Toronto today is very much like the one when I was in graduate school in the 1970s and the population is doubled. So there's a lot of development that hasn't happened. Um, and uh, uh, it, it's because you, you've had some changes in political leadership. Uh, just last week, there's an Ontario government, there's an example of this. Um, there's an article in today's New York Times about the need to put in new uh, signal systems in, in the New York subway and how basically it's going to require two Democratic politicians, uh, the, the governor of New York and the mayor of New York City, to kind of get along to make this happen. So when you're dealing with something as large and complex as a transportation system and other infrastructure pro projects, you begin to come up against some of the limits that localities have and the resource limits for sure, but they're also, you need that construction of political um, goodwill as well. I think it's a really important point, but I'm curious to hear um, in your mind, what are the advantages that cities have, whether when it comes to dealing with a challenge like this or others, um, uh, areas where they can do things better than the federal government or even the, the state or provincial government? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, again, when you're talking about infrastructure, at some point, it really, you need the local knowledge right. to, to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And you need the local commitment. Um, um, you know, there may be federal grants mm -hmm. coming in, but at the end of the day, what's getting built and how it's getting built and where it's getting built depends very much on local at least, or region. But even on broader issues, I can imagine there are an, a variety of advantages of trying to do things at oh, the local our, level. Education so. would be a, a, another mm -hmm. area, which in the U.S. is, is uh, uh, largely local, but in other countries is not. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an, another area where there's a distinct advantage. I also think the uh, job skills issues that we've been talking about, where the actual business community understands uh, what its needs are uh, better than any other outside area. That would be another area where these local connections are important. I would imagine in, in some cities, um, and New York City actually has borne this out, that um, lack of bureaucracy and red tape is also right. hugely right. Um, uh, beneficial. Cities can simply move much faster right. than uh, larger, um, more exactly. complicated governments can. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to go beyond, you can move even faster, if we think about infrastructure not as roads and bridges and airports, but mobile connectivity, that's a place where the private sector is, right. le is leading. And I think that's particularly interesting in countries where there isn't a stronger, hard infrastructure. So speaking with the World Trade Center in Ghana, um, they really pointed repeatedly to the idea that the expansion of mobile penetration has been a primary driver of inward investment into the country because co companies are seeing the new opportunities um, to, to engage with people economically via that sort of more virtual infrastructure, um, and also the development of SMEs locally going out into international markets, again, leveraging the, that skill set, but that, that mobile infrastructure is really being transformative for them and not bound by the traditional um, barriers that stop good infrastructure projects from starting. So I have lots more questions to ask, but I want to give uh, you all an opportunity if you want to wade into the conversation now. Um, if not, I can keep going, but if there are questions, um, raise your hand and we have a, a, Stephanie has a microphone if anybody wants to jump in. Okay, hearing none, I'll continue. Um, can I just make a, a yeah, comment, please. Uh, Jonathan, while we're waiting for, for some questions? And I just want to thank uh, Foreign Policy on behalf of all of my over 300 uh, World Trade Centers that, that I feel honored to, uh, to represent here. Uh, for the light that you are shining on the important work that World Trade Centers do throughout the world. They are an important resource of, of what's happening in their local communities, uh, but also they are really building a business for their, their companies. They are affecting, they have local uh, impact, as the title indicates, global connections, uh, local growth. 
And it's largely with small and medium-sized businesses, as I talk to my counterparts around the world, when you think of it, don't have access to the knowledge, the resources that larger companies do, and yet they create, as Claire said, the majority of the jobs. I look upon World Trade Centers as fantastic connectors. Yeah. Uh, we connect with the City of Philadelphia Commerce Department, with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, with the Economic Development Administration of uh, the U.S. Department of, of Commerce, with e county economic development organizations, chambers of commerce, all focus on how can we make greater Philadelphia a world-class region? How can we drive greater economic growth and job creation uh, through trade? Uh, we're all small, or many of us are small organizations, so we need, we depend upon this collaboration and I really think it's as I listen to my colleagues around the world it's World Trade Centers that that really uh, provide a very very important uh, function so uh, thank you to foreign policy for giving us this this opportunity to shed shed light uh, on the important work that we are doing uh, worldwide and the the important network uh, that we that we represent uh, next week I'll be welcoming We'll be welcoming the World Trade Center Tan Jen, uh, who is coming to Philadelphia, Greater Philadelphia, to look at uh, how they can connect with us in the important areas of biopharma and gene therapy. Uh, this past March, we had as our keynote speaker uh, Jeff Morazzo of Spark Therapeutics. He is doing some incredible work, and it's just an example of what's taking place in life sciences in, in uh, Philadelphia, in gene therapy, just developed a cure for, uh, to, uh, to treat blindness. Uh, so this cooperation with the World Trade Center in Tangen is one example of how we connect our businesses with businesses throughout the world. And all of our World Trade Centers, whether they have big buildings or trade services programs like ours um, or uh, business services as in Leal, they're doing the same thing. Uh, so we're just really pleased to have this opportunity uh, for folks to get to know about the, the tremendous impact that we believe we have. And if Linda, if I can add to that, Jonathan, as well, uh, you know, we've got Especially plenty of examples. Especially if you're going to say more nice things about well, foreign policy. <laughs> I'm gonna, well, she said gratefully so, because uh, I think, uh, just to echo that, uh, this report has, uh, you know, opened up a discussion that is parallel to exactly who we are as an association. Uh, you know, we would have started 50-odd years ago, and our thinking back then might very well have been to try to make uh, each of these world trades in a very cookie-cutter and very similar. And what we've ended up with 50 years later is a very diverse association, which I think is on matched around the world. So it's not only the global network and the local connections, but the ability to uh, react and to act, which is really, I think, important for this association. And a couple of examples would be at one end of the scale, we've got a very large World Trade Center developing in, in Harbin, uh, in the breadbasket of China. They're very focused on uh, food uh, safety and innovation and just securing that, you know, China, sure that China has a, a secure supply of food into the future. Their World Trade Center is also uh, scheduled to be well over, and I have to question this in my mind every time I say it, it's well over 2.3 million square meters, so over 20 million square feet. This isn't a massive complex. It will be the largest World Trade Center in the globe. However, they, uh, they wanted to engage through the World Trade Center with other World Trade Centers who are passionate about food safety and food innovation. And just as a result, at our last GA, we signed uh, an MOU. Uh, initially started with 12 World Trade Centers, it grew to 40 World Trade Centers, it included Accra, it included Riyadh, it included Saskatoon, included cities from all around the world that are focused on agriculture. So now you've got this massive World Trade Center complex and small members and media members all engaging. So we formalized that into what we're calling a member advisory council. And that group communi communicates on a monthly basis and they're exchanging ideas. On the other side of it, we've got another member in Trieste in northeastern uh, Italy, and they are very involved with SMEs, and they are constantly hosting and, and sending trade missions around the globe, food, wine, other areas. Um, so they're very active. Andy Garwood is, the, uh, is our board member, is also head of that World Trade Center. But they also work with the Samar shipping line, which is a massive shipping line, and they also partner with 
uh, science parks. So what came from that is some research that we've done to discover that we've got over 80 World Trade Center cities around the globe that have active science parks, part of that association. So we recently just signed an MOU amongst that group to do the exact same thing, which is to explore how we can leverage and connect and overlay World Trade Center activity with the science park and innovation activity. So for me, that's the, the biggest thing. It's not only the diversity of our members and how, and how quickly they connect and how connected they are at the global level, but the fact that they've got these local relationships they can move very, very quickly on some of these issues. I, I want to underscore one point because it's come up several times, and it goes back to the very beginning where Claire talked about the investment in human capital. Um, you were just talking about science parks. Philadelphia is an ideal uh, model for what I want to say. Universities, research centers, health, the healthcare industry writ large are vitally important for sustaining and regenerating urban growth right now. And I think it was, it, it, the Philadelphia example is a very good example to look at. And I think it, it, it goes back, though, to one of Claire's first points that what how is local growth happening? It's happening because of sustained investment in the people who live there. Mm -hmm. and, and that allows you to attract new people in. It, it's upping the skill levels of people there, the opportunity levels. And I think that's an important general point that it comes out in this report. And you've just heard both of my pa uh, fellow panelists uh, touch on it. So I just wanted to be sure to emphasize. In fact, interesting point to, to your point, uh, Blair, is that I, I spoke about Jeff Morazzo of Spark Therapeutics. He got his start uh, uh, supported by the Children's Hospital of, of Philadelphia and uh, the University of Pennsylvania uh, developing, uh, they're supporting a, an incubator uh, for him. And uh, so that's how he got his start and that it helped to launch uh, Spark uh, Therapeutics. So that's that wonderful collaboration mm -hmm. between universities, research, uh, developed there and uh, the business uh, community and large inst institutions like CHOP. But I also want to underscore the importance of small and medium-sized businesses. I, I owned and operated a small business with my father many years ago before my career in government. It's probably, I learned the best life and, and business lessons of, of, uh, of my entire life. So I have a great and enormous respect for small businesses. And they are really the majority of, of the, the clients uh, or the companies that, that we serve. Last year alone, companies with whom we work generated about $143 million in additional documented additional exports. If we looked over the lifetime of our own organization, which is we're about 16 years of age, that number grows to over $1.6 billion just from the growth of those uh, small businesses. Uh, and that supports thousands of jobs in, in the region. So when you talk about uh, local growth or local, local impact, uh, that's, that's what I'm, I'm talking about. Well, let's explore this a little bit more because the, the report highlights that as important, as critical as SMEs are, they often struggle to go global, for example. Um, why is that? What are the barriers that they face? Um, and um, how can um, cities and organizations like WTCA help them overcome that? I mean, I'll throw a comment to start. Just I know from my own experience in Halifax, you know, there was always a challenge because the stats that we have, of course, show that SMEs contribute well over 50% of either jobs or GDP development. But if you look at the percentage that are actually exporting, internationally it's down to approximately 10%. Mm -hmm. So there actually is a gap there, and, and our experience it really has been around. It's about information and training and confidence. And I think there's a role for the World Trade Centers because we are so connected at the grassroots level within those communities that a number of them now put on regular training programs that are, are focused towards uh, training on, on import and exporting and how you go about that and also partnering with universities. So I think what we can do is we can, we're already operating at the grassroots level. Our members are those SMEs. We need to make sure that we're spending time with them in each city to understand what their needs are and then provide them some support. It was interesting, uh, Philadelphia, Greater Philadelphia participated in the Global Cities Initiative of uh, the Brookings Institution and, and J.P. Morgan Chase. We were one of over 28 metros participating in looking at our export economy. It's a $32 billion 
export economy, which is sizable, but there's tremendous room for growth. And one of the things that we found is that there is a tremendous ecosystem of, of, of folks like the World Trade Center in Greater Philadelphia to provide services, but there is a general lack of awareness of the availability of these services. So I think that's part of the, the challenge uh, in merely making it known that there are are organizations that have the expertise and the know-how uh, to really help these small businesses. And I think overall, and I'm looking back at my career in the federal government as well, there's a perception of risk that, uh, that ooh, I'm successful domestically, I don't necessarily want to go into international work, there, there's risk, but we're here to share with, with small businesses that there are ways to anticipate that, to reduce risk, uh, and to and to uh, help support your success uh, in in global markets and for that reason uh, to your point Scott we conduct educational seminars and, and global business conferences to provide that kind of, of information that is, is helpful to them. And Linda, two World Trade Centers in particular, many of our World Trade Centers have education, trade education programs that they're running either singularly or in partnership. And our World Trade Center in Taiwan, as well in Santiago, both operate very, very extensive uh, programs where they are graduating thousands of students every year in and around this space. So there's some very, very big programs as well as community-based programs that are happening. Any questions? Claire, what else do you want to call out from the report that well, you think Well, actually, I just wanted to pick up on this point because mm -hmm. one of the things I thought was most interesting, and when I first heard about it in an interview, I assumed that would be the one time, and it turned out a number of the different um, organizations that I spoke with were doing this, which was, I mentioned it a, a bit before, the idea of a learning circle, um, where you're connecting executives within a city, within a community, some who have extensive experience trading and, and, and investing internationally and some who have no, we, none. Um, we talked a bit um, in our interviews and in, in the report about accidental exporters, um, people who did not intend or have a sort of going to market strategy to leaving the U.S. or, or their home country, whatever it might be, for the first time. And, and that can actually be a negative experience that turns them off of, of, of global trade and global investment going forward. Um, and so having actually export strategies, talking to folks who are successful and operating internationally, being able to casually work through issues with a peer network was one of the, the, the more interesting to me ideas um, in terms of sort of mentorship within a peer network. And it's a lot, it's a lot sometimes easier to, to talk over your problem with, with someone who's, who's engaging with it than just sit in, sitting and sort of taking in information and training. That's, so. that's an important point, uh, Claire, that you, that, that you make. We, I have a, a program at the World Trade Center of Greater Philadelphia, it's our China Club, and uh, companies do exactly that. They share their experience in China, they share what has worked, what has not worked, what to avoid, and it's this mentorship and, and learning from one another that uh, is a tremendous resource for our, our companies. You're absolutely right. And if there's one other thing I wanted to highlight was also the role in not just focusing on SMEs, but also sort of underserved communities within our cities. Mm -hmm. So it was it's speaking with one of the World Trade Centers in India where they focused on women entrepreneurs and how to empower and, and train um, women entrepreneurs to enter into global marketplace and making that a focus. And I think New Orleans in the US is working with Bar like the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce um, and, a, and a range of other sort of underserved business groups to, to ensure that they have the ability and the skills and the know-how to, to engage in global markets. So that's, a, that's something we don't talk about a lot, that different parts mm -hmm. of the different business community have different access to finance, um, different background, different relationships. And there is also a role to, to uh, I, 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 this might be going too far, but to iron out some of the some of the things that I think have created negative perceptions about globalization. So uh, that's a good point, Claire, because the way our World Trade Centers approach this is it really starts with what the needs are, what the resources are for the community, and that could be different from one part of the world to the, to the other. And we clearly have, we've got a World Trade Center here in Washington, where Andrew's here with us today, and they focus, of course, on a significant number of major international diplomatic-related and, and trade and business events. And that's a great opportunity for our network to plug into that network. He's part of a network that uh, has a World Trade Center in Dublin, which is far different on technology and trade services. Same thing in Boston, they take a different approach. So if you look at World Trade Centers around the globe, you will see that each of our World Trade Centers, there's a lot of commonality, but there's also some very specific focuses that they have. 
And that's the beauty of this because you can reach out to some other part of the world if you're looking for some innovation and ideas in some very, very specific area. In a relatively short order, you can get a connect and a response. And I don't really think you can do that many, with many international organizations these days. And building upon uh, that, Scott, um, and an earlier, your earlier question, Jonathan, about why small businesses uh, don't get into international markets, it's the perception of risk, but it's also, uh, will that customer, how, do I, how well do I know that customer? Will that customer, will I get paid uh, for my sales to that, that customer? So there, there's that real hesitancy. And think of it that now small businesses have a trusted advisor locally, but that can connect them with international markets with World Trade Centers around the world uh, so that we connect with our counterparts. They know their markets very well. They know the players in the market. So it's that, uh, that, that element of trust that we have in working with our colleagues around the world that we can make available to businesses in our own local market. I want to go back and pick up on the, the theme that Claire put out on underserved communities because I think it's really important for thinking about world trade centers but also other business uh, communities. Um, you know, one of the most one of the largest challenges cities everywhere in the world are facing right now is the growth of inequality. And with an issue like inequality, affordable housing is another one of these issues. You can think of it locally, but when the same local problems pop up globally, there's something structural that's going on. And uh, this, is, this is one of those issues, again, that's larger than any group represented by World Trade Centers or anybody in this room is going to solve on its own, but it is another vehicle for engaging with the issue. And uh, I think it's, I, I think the um, focus of some of the World Trade Centers on serving underserved communities is really important and it's an important dimension to sustainable local growth. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and I, I just want to be sure that that issue, I'm, I'm glad uh, mm -hmm. Claire reminded us it's in the report. It's an important part of the report. And broadly, mm -hmm. populism being a global trend, one of the things we found, and it, it, it was across all the cities, um, statistically significant result, um, was that inward FDI actually is associated with workforce participation. So not employment per se, but, but a larger share of your population active in the workforce. Um, which, which is a really interesting result to me in terms of the dynamism of a community and the desire um, to, be, to be part of the economy. Um, we often talk about unemployment rates, but that doesn't capture all the folks who have left the workforce. So having a one point, I think it was 1.5% higher workforce participation rate as a share of your population, it, um, for someone correct me here, a billion in FDI. <laughs> um, what is, is really kind of a significant and interesting issue when we think about how to reframe trade, reframe globalization, and ensure that, that everyone is benefiting and can see those benefits. Yeah. Claire, can I add just one other just one last comment? But, um, you know, it is shocking when you look at the, the contribution that SMEs play in relation to the percentage that are actually importing or, ex or sorry, exporting. Now, one of the things that we've tried to do with our association is during our uh, GA every year, we had our uh, annual General Assembly in Lay Ward in the Northern Netherlands just this uh, spring, is that it's not just built for members. The way the system was built is we had over 500 delegates, a third of which would have been World Trade Centers, a third of which would have been uh, visiting SMEs in the form of business delegations from Africa and from the United States and Canada and other parts of the world. And the other third was really based on local uh, companies. And they, they focused on themes, water management, health, food, agriculture, and, and because they're experts in that space. And so in addition to our conference, we had a four or five day uh, you know, interchange and activity amongst, amongst those businesses that, that nev never would have normally met face to face. So really, we often talk about our network. It's great that we talk about our members and what they're doing, but it's the members of members that we're always trying yeah. to get at. And I think the members of members are these SMEs, and we're always looking for tools to introduce those because, as we all know, you connect two people face to face. If they've got anything at all to talk about, uh, then you've got an opportunity. Mm -hmm. We're almost out of time, but we have a quick question for you. Yeah, hi, I'm Jeff Sol with the American Planning Association. So 
Uh, you, you've hinted at a lot of the things that uh, urban planners do, and I want to call that out as a resource because obviously uh, if you want to get connected to infrastructure or neighborhoods or issues of equity, our members are out there and uh, hope that you're talking to them and looking at that. But the question I have is um, this issue of quality of life, uh, I want you to directly uh, talk about culture, uh, arts, and all those kind of intangible aspects because you sort of hinted at it, but I'd like to raise that issue directly because you talk about how to attract talent and uh, I know most of you know uh, Richard Florida years ago coined the phrase uh, you know creative class and that's what was driving growth in cities so I'd like to hear your views on that. Blair you want to speak to that? You know there's a really really interesting brand new book out um, by an author named Kabanda, Patrick Kabanda and it's called The Creative Wealth of Nations and he is a really interesting character. He's from Uganda. He is a Juilliard-trained organist, and a, he worked as an economist at the World Bank. And his point is we fundamentally devalue the importance of creativity when we think about wealth. And the question he's trying to solve is why is it that countries that are thought of as being underdeveloped often have incredibly sophisticated and rich cultures. And, it's be, and he then begins to talk about how economists need to engage. The creation of beauty is a fundamental aspect of human existence. And, and it's important not just because it creates jobs or it creates, you know, there's a nice park that, that somebody coming into the city may want to hang out in. It, it, it sustains identity. It creates pathways that open up opportunities for people to engage one another. And I think uh, the, these quality of life issues often get overlooked, but they're, they're uh, and I think Patrick argues this in, in the book, they're often the factors that actually elevate the opportunities for growth in other areas. So I'm really glad Jeff you raised that. And just to echo that, in speaking, the person who most empathi empathized this to me was World Trade Center in Gibraltar. That their primary focus is how do they work with the local community to make it an attractive destination for people to want to come live and work. Yep. Um, and how do they create those resources, whether it's in the arts or sports or what have you, that make it an attractive destination. And that's his real sort of singular focus, because that's how you actually draw people to, to make it an attractive place to do business. And Claire, you, you can build such a, a city for sure, right? But I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're relying on promotion, uh, social media, other means to kind of promote that, that that's tough to do. So you, at some point, you need to get your customer into the city to experience it firsthand. And mm -hmm. it's, it's no, uh, you know, it's been going on for a thousand years. You want to sell a car, you test drive it. You want to sell a product, you sample it. I mean, you have to get people into your city to test it. And whether or not they want to send their kids to school there, they want to retire there, they want to invest, they want to come on a vacation, mm -hmm. they want to come back, any number of things can flow from that. So, of course, business, B2B, trade missions, conferences, conventions, all the things that many of our members do it really focus on that. You've got to get people to sample your city. And I just want to add, in, in the case of, of Philadelphia, and thank you for, for raising this, this issue and this, this question, anyone that's familiar with the city of Philadelphia over the past 10, 15 years more have seen a, literally a transformation where there's a, now a very vibrant arts and cultural uh, life and, and, and community and, and a diversity of, of cuisine and, and restaurants. And that is, I think, directly tied to our ability to attract uh, talent and why we're seeing such a surge in the millennial community. Yes, they ha they're together with like-minded individuals and they feel supported, but they also know that they have access to affordable living, but also this quality of life. So very, very important to attracting investment. One last question at the back. Hi there. Uh, monitoring our social media back here, I just want to get one of our online viewers the Great. question, which is quite simple. Um, do you plan where to put World Trade Centers? I will say, uh, we are always on the lookout. Uh, we have an incredible network. Many of our uh, leads in World Trade Centers come from within the existing system because our our cities, our World Trade Centers are very, very proud. Uh, they're very excited with what we're doing. And often, uh, we will get referrals 
from uh, other parts of the world, but through World Trade Centers. We've got a very, very healthy funnel of cities that want to become World Trade Centers. And I should add, it is a, a rather lengthy, there's an application process, there's a lot of uh, detail we need to get on understanding what your development is going to look like. We're looking for a physical presence. We want to understand what the priorities are of that community, how you're going to engage. Uh, there's a lot of detail that we need. So that process takes a long time. We'll add anywhere from 15 to 20 members a year. So we've got a very healthy interest around the globe on World Trade Centers and uh, as often you get most of your customers uh, from your already satisfied customers. Well, on that note, I think we're out of time so we need to stop. Uh, I just want to thank you all for coming. Um, I want to encourage you to download the report which really is superb. I want to encourage you all to subscribe to Foreign Policy and then <laughs> to subscribe again because you can never have too many FP I mean. subscriptions. Um, and, and can I just thank the team that worked on this? And yes, thanks very much to the team. Great job. Yeah. Um, and uh, please join me in thanking our fabulous panelists as well. Thank you.